So, I get the pleasure of introducing my wife, Erica. I want to give you a little bit of backstory because I don't, I don't get to introduce my wife very often, right? How often do you get to introduce your spouse like in this way? So, um, when I first met Erica, she seemed very quiet and very sweet, kind, generous, all those things she still is. Uh, and then the backstory is that she's a daredevil, she's a stunt devil, she's, got these, she's done some crazy stuff, and then I've watched her do crazy stuff since then. So, um, you know, she is a, a registered nurse and did that for a while and actually was in sales and nursing. But before that, she decided that she wanted to be a professional parachutist. I didn't even know that was a thing. But apparently, if you jump out of a plane a couple hundred or a thousand or more times, you can get good enough to where you can actually compete on a national level. And so she actually has jumped out of a plane 1,200 times, had her own chute, had her own stuff, her helmet. I was just like, what? <laughs> Who is this person who has all this stuff? Then, and just to show you her courage, so she is a lifelong learner. She reads books. She read books for her uh, uh, visit with you this uh, afternoon. She studies all the time. She takes courses. She works on herself all the time. It's nonstop. She's taking a course right now on mindfulness and, and nonviolent communication. So she's just in the space that we're in today, and she's in that space all the time. And then if that wasn't crazy enough about jumping out of the plane and, being a par and doing the parachute thing for our second child, Sophia, she said, you know what? I'm just going to do this natural childbirth thing. And I'm like, you know the last kid we had, we went to the hospital and you had an epidural, right? You remember that? Because I was there. <laughs> and it looked painful to me. <laughs> she was like, nope, I'm going to do it. So she literally studied, joined groups. When I'm talking about surrounding yourself with people that think differently or think, she literally surrounded herself with people, started studying, leaned into these groups, and figured out how she wanted to do this natural childbirth thing. We actually did it at the midwife's house. It had a suite in the basement. We went over there. We show up at, uh, I show up at home about 3.30 in the afternoon. She's like, I'm having these contractions, and they're pretty intense. And all of a sudden, she'd like, like this. And I'm like, oh, gosh. She said, but they're not close enough together. And I'm like, that looks pretty intense to me. <laughs> but so I, I call my mom. Mom, can you come watch our son, Sam? And I think we should go ahead and go to the midwife's house. And so we pack up, and we get to the midwife's house. We arrive about 4.30 or something like this. And I'm bringing in our bags, and the midwife is kind of coming up and down the stairs. And she says, so how are things going? I said, I think we're ready to have this baby, but Erica thinks the contractions are too far apart. Like three minutes later, the midwife's like, yeah, she's dilated to a nine, and we're having this baby right now. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God. So I think we showed up around 4.30. Sophia was born around 5.30, 5.15, 5.30, something like that. We hung out at the midwife's house for an hour or two. She came downstairs and said, you guys can leave whenever you want. We packed up and went home. And so basically, that was a really interesting date night. It was kind of like the way we reflected back on it. It was like we kind of went out for dinner, and we came back with a baby. Um, but I watched her do that. I watched her do that with no, no, no drugs, no anything. She just put her mind to it and did it, and that's my wife. She's very dedicated. Once she sets her mind to something, she just surrounds herself with the information, the people, the stuff to make it happen, and I watch her go through it. And it's not like it's just smooth and easy, and it's, no, it's rocky and bumpy, and I watch her struggle with stuff and learn and integrate stuff, but that's how it works in life, right? If we want something, we gotta, we gotta lean in, we gotta dedicate ourselves to it, and we gotta figure it out. So with that, I'd like to introduce my beautiful wife, Erica. Well, that's actually true what he said. <laughs> All those things happened. Um, I'm Certifiably, yes, I've jumped out of a plane 1,200 times, um, did natural childbirth, and, and at 37 weeks pregnancy, decided I was going to start studying hypnobirthing, so I dove into that, and it all worked out, you know, thank God. <laughs> so I know that this is a really long day for all of you, and I want to just applaud you for still being here, so thank you. I'm nice and fresh right now, and I know that you're probably not. So you all are diehards, and you, you should be proud of yourself. And I love this little baby energy, because I'm like a sucker for babies, that I get this cute little baby to look at. So before we get started, I just want to kind of reset your energy, if you don't mind. So if everybody could just stand up. Just stand on up. And... I want you to look up at the ceiling and just lift your arms up. And take a deep breath in 
and then exhale and just bring those arms down. Let's do that one more time. Look up to the ceiling, bring those arms up, breathe in, and exhale down, bring those arms down and say, I am awake. I am alert. I'm still going. Okay, thank you. We just did a reset of your brain. So go ahead and have a seat. So speaking of brains, we're going to talk about the brain tonight. And um, I am a science geek at heart, and that's, I think, why they chose, chose me to do this talk. Um, so today is about transformation, right? It's about breakthroughs. It's about transformation. It's about identifying our limiting beliefs. And it's about moving out of those, because all of us, what do we really want in life? We want to be happy. We want to be content. We all have dreams, don't we? We all have things that we want to achieve, but there's always like this lingering thing, and we call it a limiting belief system. And it could be multiple limiting belief systems that we're holding. And these limiting beliefs are what keep us from achieving these high goals that we hold for ourselves. So one of the things that I want to talk about, and I'm going to go a little bit into depth, but not too much because I don't want to lose you. But I want to talk about the brain. We've got this powerhouse up here. It's called the brain. There's so many intricate system and pathways going on. It's just hard to just, just understand. So I'm going to break it down a little bit. And we're going to talk about four different parts of the brain. So the first part of the brain that I want to talk about is the basal ganglia. <laughs> and you do not have to remember all this. I'm not going to test you on this. So don't worry about it. I'm going to throw out some fancy terms. Who cares? The point is, I want you to know that we have changeability with our brains and that we can change behavior that is limiting our lives. And we can make those changes to achieve what we want in life. So the basal ganglia. Is, a, is like a cluster of neuronal structures deep inside the brain. So when we're talking about like deep-rooted uh, belief systems, things that we learned maybe in childhood, things that we learned from society, our culture, media, anything like that, it roots down into this basal ganglia. So the other part of this is We've got what we call the amygdala. In the amygdala, there's actually two amygdalas in the brain. There's their little almond-shaped structures. They're located in the temporal lobes of the brain. So we're looking at the midbrain. And that is responsible for fear. That is responsible for that fight or flight that we come across. So when we're looking at fear, Gavin De Becker wrote a book, and it's called The Gift of Fear. And he was an FBI agent. He was a very high-profile professional. And he was an expert in the topic of fear. And fear, when it comes to things that are endangering our lives, is certainly something that we want that amygdala to fire, right? And like, if a predator is chasing us, if somebody is trying to burn our house down, we want that amygdala to fire up because that's what we need. We, we need to be on fight or flight. We need to get out of that situation. But what he talks about is psychological fear. That is the fear that is false. That's the kind of fear that we get stuck in. That's the kind of fear that it's like the, I don't know if I can do that. What if I fail? Or I don't know if I can do that. What if nobody shows up? Or what if this happens? Or what if that happens? Or what if I succeed? What if I succeed? That's scary too. So those are all of those just false fears that hold us in this frightened state. And that's what keeps us from stepping into this highest version of our shining selves. And that's where we want to be, right? When you daydream or when you think about that, you're thinking about this like superhuman, you know, you want to do all these things, but then that voice comes in, doesn't it? And it tells you, you can't do that. 
You're not good enough for that. Remember that one time when that thing happened? You can't do that. So that's the amygdala firing. The reason why that's important is when we see those thoughts, those erroneous thoughts coming into play, we can go, oh yeah, that's the amygdala. And it's lying because that's not true. Nobody's chasing me, nobody's trying to kill me, right? It's just psychological fear. So, you know about the basal ganglia? You know about the amygdala? So the next thing is, and this is like the superpower part, is the prefrontal cortex. I like to call this like the mac daddy of the brain. Okay, so if you can't remember prefrontal cortex, just remember it's the mac daddy, okay? So the prefrontal cortex, if you think about the front part of the brain, you've all, all heard probably about the frontal lobe. Yep. So the frontal lobe. So the prefrontal cortex is overlying the frontal lobe. And the left side of the prefrontal cortex is responsible for all the feel-good emotions. You know, it's that happy, it's that joyful, it's that content, it's that I just feel good about life. You know, that's our thinking, that's our doing, that's our I'm going to go get it done. I have that confidence. Now, the right side of the prefrontal cortex is more responsible for things like sadness and things. So we want to focus on the left side of the prefrontal cortex. So to add to that, I'm going to get all sciencey on you right now. Okay, are you all ready? <laughs> okay, you don't have to remember this. So back in 2012, there was a group of MIT researchers that discovered there is a little part on the prefrontal cortex, and it's called the infralimbic cortex, the IL cortex. And why that's important is they found that when we, uh, when we affect this, it can turn on and off behaviors in a moment's instance. Why is that important? Why is that important to know? That means we can change our behavior, even fully ingrained, entrenched behaviors that we don't think we can get rid of. No matter what we do, we can change it in a moment's instance. What it does, it, it has the ability to turn on and off that path, those pathways that affect the basal ganglia. Remember, that's where all those ingrained structures are deep in the brain. Turns them on and off. So all it has to do is turn it off and boom, you go from something that's eliminating you to boom, you go to something that's allowing you to rise to these high heights of who you want to be. That's super, super awesome, you guys. So I want you to have hope that we can affect change in our lives. Matt and Maria wanted me to do a talk like this because they wanted me to bring the science to this. They didn't want you all coming in here going, yeah, that's just a bunch of woo-woo stuff. I don't know about all this. There's science to this. You know, there's data so to, to support this. So I want you to understand that. When you leave this room, if you remember nothing else, remember your brains can change. They can change in a, in a moment. So we've talked about the structures of the brain, and I want to talk a little bit about neuroplasticity. Has anybody heard of this word? Woo, you guys are good. Neuroplasticity. This is the adaptability, the, the awesome adaptability of the brain to change. Not only is it changing its physical structure, but it's changing its function. So what that means is we all have these ingrained beliefs. We have these pathways. If you want to think about neural pathways in the brain, our neural pathways are created by the input that we're getting from the world. It starts out when we're your little baby's age, okay? Right now your sweet little baby is taking in all this, oh, all the good stuff, right? All the love, taking in that life is safe, life is beautiful, I've got a beautiful mama. As we get older, we start just taking in data from everywhere, okay? And that starts forming all the neural pathways, good and bad, all of it. Our parents, our parents' friends, 
school, bullies, our best friends, our worst friends, media. I mean, you, you I mean, it, we could just go on and on, but all that input is framing our neural pathways. So the more that we do a certain behavior, the more that we're repetitive in a certain behavior, we do it over and over and over and over again, the more we think a certain thought or a certain set of thoughts and we think them over and over and over again, guess what? The brain goes, I'm gonna be really strong in that area. <laughs> Like, I'm gonna be a master in that area, and I'm just gonna to default to that because this person seems to wanna to think this or do this all the time, so I'm just gonna fire that way. And so that's your default. That's your default. So you might say, well, I can't help it. So I do life coaching, you know, so I'm a life coach. Um, I do a lot of mindfulness practices and things, and I have a client that's, She's getting ready to turn 60. She's very nervous about it. And we talk about mindfulness practices and all the benefits of them. And she says, I don't know, Erica. I've just been doing this place for so long. How can I possibly change? And she just, I could just see it in her face. She just felt so defeated. And I really had to have a talk to, with her about how we have this changing ability in the brain. Now it takes work, it takes hard work. It's not like I'm just gonna think, I'm just gonna change and it's just gonna happen. It doesn't work that way and we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. But absolutely, you can change. I brought all these index cards and I'm not even looking at them, okay? So I just wanna make sure that I'm staying on track. So when we talk about neuroplasticity, it affects all areas of our life. Our relationships, our workplace, our happiness, our moods, how we view life, how we show up in life. Neuroplasticity affects everything. So all of this is a very internal process as we're looking to make change. I'm assuming that there's not one person here that goes, you know what? I'm, I'm happy with every part of my life. I don't even know I'm here. Is there anybody like here? No? Okay, me neither. I'm still working on stuff. Just like Matt said, I'm always, always learning. So when you think about relationships, here's one thing. How are you showing up? Do you have any default programming that you're like, I don't even understand why I'm doing this behavior. I know it's not good for me. I know it's not healthy, but yet I keep doing it. Why is that? It's because that part of your brain is so heavily wired that it doesn't know what else to do. That's why. So you've got to train it in another way. I had a client once that was, he was uh, in the military. He was about 24 years old. He came in, his dad had referred him to me. I had also worked with his dad. His dad was an orthopedic surgeon. His son had just, you know, he'd come out of the military. He was biting his fingernails off and they were all down to nubs. He couldn't even look at me. He was just, he, he was just like an anxious ball. And I thought, oh wow, I've really got my work cut out for me here. And you know, Dr. Chris said, hey, I really, can you just help my son out? I just want him to have a normal life. He wasn't able to work. He wasn't able to sleep. He was really just, just so anxious, and that's because his brain was firing in a certain way that his amygdala, you know, was overproductive. So we needed to get him into the left prefrontal cortex. So what we did was we worked on breath work. Miss Brooke's gonna be working with you later on this. We worked on breath work. We worked on presence. We worked on mindfulness, and he stayed the course. You know, I was just a guide, but he was doing all the meditations, just like I asked him to. He was doing it morning and night for 20 minutes. The next time I saw him, he looked like a different person. And I was like, I'm witnessing a miracle right now. I mean, what's going on? This, this guy is a completely different guy right now. And he goes, I just feel so much better. 
I don't even know what's happening. I just feel so much better. And his, there was light in his face. His eyes were bright. He could actually relax. And it was such a blessing as someone in my role working with somebody just to see that kind of a progress so rapidly. And so we kept at it, and we just kept, I just meditated with him, honestly. I just meditated with him. We worked on breath work. I did a little bit of teaching, a little coaching. But I just helped him, and I was just like his encourager. And after two or three sessions, he was completely different. And then after, you know, a couple more times, he was like, I'm good. I'm good. He was doing great. He went on and became a paramedic. You know, he got into a relationship, highly functioning person. And that's the way it happens. That's exactly the way it happens. You choose your goal. You don't get stuck in the way you are. You do the work, you stay the course, and then the changes happen because he changed the firing of his neurons. So speaking of staying the course, that is one of the most important things that you need to do when you're looking to change your behavior and change this wiring. It's not enough just to have a thought, I wanna change. Okay, and then you just go do what you always do. That's not enough. If you spent five minutes with your spouse once every two weeks, do you think you would have a close relationship? Does anybody think that? No, you're not putting in the time, you're not putting in the effort, you're not putting in the focus, and it's the same thing here. You've got to stay the course. So you've got to choose what it is that you want, you find the steps to do, and you stay the course. You focus on that, and that is how your neural pathways will shift. The more often you do this new behavior, the more often you think these new thoughts, your brain is going to change. Your behavior is going to change. The people around you are gonna go, what happened to you? Like, what, did you go on a spa retreat? I mean, what happened to you? <laughs> and you're gonna go, hey, I changed my brain. Okay, I changed my brain. Because that's what you have to do. You have to immerse yourself into this new way of being. And it literally is an immersion. Now the nice thing is, is that once you start behaving in this new way, once you start thinking in this new way, the effort that you have to put forward to, to do this becomes less and less. And eventually, it will become your new default. And then you don't even have to try. That's the beauty of a habit. We're creating a new habit. The beauty of a habit, a habit is something you don't even think about, do you? Do you think about how to brush your teeth? Do you think about putting my shoes on? Okay, I have to do my left shoe first and then I have to do my right shoe. You don't think about it, do you? That's the beauty of a habit because it frees up your mind to think about other things. So once you put all this focus and energy and effort and heart into what you want and you get what you want, bravo, you've got a new default pattern. Now you can focus on the next thing. Isn't that encouraging? It is to me. <laughs> so to change our behavior, so I'm just gonna quickly, because I wanna stay on, I don't want you guys to be late. <laughs> I wanna stay on target, but you might wanna take notes for this part because these are actual tangible things that you can do on a daily or regular basis that will number one, help you get into that left prefrontal cortex, the Mac Daddy, okay? And number two, it will help you stay motivated and stay the course. Remember, we're talking about perseverance, sticking it out, just like all of you are still here right now. You're already showing you have these character traits to stick it out, okay? The first thing is to know and recognize your triggers. We all have triggers. A trigger is something that gets us into that old unhealthy behavior thought pattern. Maybe it's eating bad food. Maybe it's being around people that aren't necessarily good for us. Maybe it's not working out. 
it's all those things. So, so when we're looking at behaviors that we want to change, there are always triggers that are precursors to that behavior. If someone is trying to lose weight and they have a habit of eating an entire pizza before bed every night. <laughs> okay, somebody's done this in this room, I know. <laughs> That's a trigger. They go, oh, I'm so hungry. It's 10 o'clock, I'm so hungry, I have to go eat. They're not really hungry. The thing is, is that the brain is firing that way to tell them that they're hungry, but they're not really hungry because that's the way the brain has wired. So a way to eliminate that trigger is to eat more healthy, fiber-rich, healthy whole foods before that time so they're not hungry to eat the whole pizza right before bed. Okay, that's one example of just, just finding your triggers because your triggers are always going to show up. They're going to show up when you're really stressed, when you're tired, when you're wiped out, you're just going to lose it. So you have to be able to identify what those triggers are and you've got to be able to circumvent them. So they say that neurons that fire together wire together. This is a cute little thing. You can write it down if you want. So the next thing is decrease your stress levels. We've all got stress. Stress is everywhere, especially right now in our world. It's crazy madness, isn't it? So we've got to find ways to decrease our stress levels. When we are in high levels of stress, we're in fight or flight. Cortisol is just running rampant, and it's really hard to stay the course when we're like this. So we find ways to reduce our stress. How can we do that? Yoga, meditation, exercise massage, social interaction with people that are actually uplifting to us, not our Debbie Downers, okay? <laughs> I'm sure you can think of all different kinds of things to do. Sleep, sleep, seven to eight, maybe nine hours a night. That'll decrease your stress. That'll help you get into the part of the brain that you wanna be in. The next one is actually just to pay attention. Pay attention in your life. Pay attention to your daily activities, your daily interactions. It's all about awareness. It begins and it ends in awareness. When I studied in India, that was, they just drilled that into us. It, everything begins and ends with awareness. So just noticing what's working for you, what's not working for you, what's draining your energy, what's giving your energy. And do more of the things that are leading you towards your goal and try to eliminate the things or at least restrict them of the things that are dragging you down, okay? It's all about awareness. I, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to, how was your day, what happened in your day? I don't even remember. The day just kind of happened to me. I mean, how often do we do that? We, that we don't actually proactively create our day. But that's where that awareness comes in is we have to create it. Don't just let your day happen to you. And notice you have control over all of these, or not all of them, but many of the factors that are contributing to your heightened energy or to your depleted energy. The next thing is to start small. That doesn't mean to have small aspirations. I want your aspirations to be through the roof, to the sky, big as you can be, okay? But you, it is important to start small in small, manageable steps. Right now, I'm taking Taekwondo. I just got my orange belt last night. <laughs> and that is my first step towards getting my black belt. But I can't think about getting my black belt right now because it's way too overwhelming. <laughs> There's many, many, many steps in between right now and to getting that black belt. So all I can think about right now is learning the form for my orange belt with the black stripe, which my son will point out that he's already ahead of me, okay? He's so competitive. <laughs> Start small, take small, manageable steps. That will help you stay the course. We want to increase the serotonin. The serotonin is like our thinking neurotransmitter. That's our get it done neurotransmitter. We want to increase that as much as possible because that'll make us feel good. That's like getting out, making sure that we're getting plenty of sunlight, vitamin D, exercising, 
getting a massage, meditating, okay? Mindfulness practice. There's so many different ways to increase serotonin. The next one is enlist your thinking brain. You want to cons consciously think about how your life will change if you change this behavior. So it automatically puts you into the person that you want to be or whatever it is that you want to change. So you're already thinking ahead. You're already imagining as if. So how would life be this much better if I change this thought or this, these thought patterns or if I change this behavior? So you're already thinking as if. Visualization is huge here. I can't speak enough about visualization and the power of visualization. When I was, a, when I was training as a competitive skydiver, I used, we used visualization all the time because it was such a powerful um, force to create how we wanted to be when we were in the air because we didn't have a lot of training time. So everything was up here. We had to actually visualize, okay, I'm gonna exit out of the plane this way, then I'm gonna maneuver here. And it was very, very cognitive, everything that we had to do. So I got to be what I would consider a high level expertise at visualization. You can use that in every corner of your life. Number one, it feels great to visualize what you want. <laughs> it feels awesome. So if you're in the car, you're driving, you're at home, just start visualizing, just start imagining yourself being this way that you want to be. And guess what? The brain has, knows no difference between visualization and actually doing. It's still going to rewire. It doesn't know. So all you have to do is think about it, imagine it, visualize it, and you're already going to be strengthening this part of the brain. Celebrate the small victories. That will keep your dopamine flowing. Dopamine is your feel-good neurotransmitter. When my son got his orange belt in Taekwondo, I said, Sam, you should be really proud of yourself. And he just, you know, very staunchly said, I'll be proud of myself when I get my black belt. <laughs> so we had to have a little talk. <laughs> So celebrate the small victories. If you're changing your diet and you're eating all processed food and you manage to get the, the least objectionable vegetable on your plate and you eat the whole thing, that's a victory. That's a victory. You know, have a party about that, Jeannie. Have a party about that because that's big and that'll keep you going, that'll keep you motivated. The better that you feel, when you start making these changes, you're gonna notice that you feel better. And then that feeling better is going to help you to keep going with the changes. When you change your diet, when you start exercising, when you start showing up differently in your relationships, when you start taking steps maybe towards a different career. I don't know what, you know, I haven't been here all day, so I don't know what y'all are working on, but I'm just sort of grabbing at things. <laughs> so science shows that shifting away from your long-term goal and focusing more on what you're gonna do every single day leads to way more success. Do I need to say that again? Science shows that shifting away from your long-term goal and focusing on what you need to do every single day shows way more success. That doesn't mean you lose sight of your long-term goal. You can have it posted up. I have sticky notes all over my house, if you want to know the truth. But I still focus on what I need to do right now. Right now I'm focusing on my next belt for Taekwondo. I'm not thinking about black belt, okay? That's too much. Focus on the short term. That will get you to the long term. Otherwise, it can be way too overwhelming. You'll abandon ship and you'll go, I don't even know what happened. I just gave up. So the last thing I want to mention, because you've got a couple really cool processes coming up, so please don't go home, okay? I'm going to keep tabs on all of you. I know all of your faces now. <laughs> breath work. 
breath work is the bomb. I love breath work. Breath work is a wonderful way to get into that part of your brain that's going to just get you to where you need to go. It is so effective and beneficial on all different levels. It helps us calm down our brain waves. It boosts our immunity. It, it, it actually promotes nitric oxide. It's a bronchodilator in our body and helps boost immunity. It's great for digestion. It's great for stress relief. It's great for mental health, okay? It actually affects the autonomic nervous system. That's our fight or flight. And so when you get into a fight or flight, once you have been doing breath work, if you go into sort of a triggering situation, you will be much calmer. You'll be like calm as a cucumber, okay? Because you've already trained your brain to do this through this breath work. It's really awesome. It increases blood flow to the brain. Who doesn't want that, okay? So Miss Brooke, the lovely Brooke, is gonna be guiding you to, through this supreme uh, I'm not even going to run it for you because it's so cool. You're going to love it. So, we've gone over the structures of the brain. We've gone over some things that are going to hopefully help you to stay the course because that's what I want for all of you today is to stay the course. I don't want you to just think something and then maybe do it for two days when you get home and then just give up. Please don't do that, okay? I want this to be lasting change for each of you. I know that's why you're here. I know you can do it. I believe in you. And there's this really wonderful quote that I really, I, I believe so strongly in, and it says, change is not a word, it's action. It's action. That's how we're gonna show up. The only person that's going to affect this change for you is you. Nobody else. So believe in yourself. And that's all I've got. Thank you. That my son, and he did say that the other night when she came home, she came home with her orange belt and uh, last night. And, and so she brought home her orange belt. She was like, hey, I got my orange belt, Sam. And Sam looked at her and goes, yeah, but it doesn't have the white stripe. I have the white stripe. And I was like, you're funny. <laughs> but, uh, so yes, give it up one more time for my beautiful wife, Erica. It's, it's always an adventure at our house. It's always an adventure. We never know where that's headed.